We're so excited that you're here. We are pumped about, uh, we are really pumped about life groups and so many things coming on. You can go ahead and pick up your Bibles and turn in or on your Bibles to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6 is where we're going to really hang out a lot today. And, and let me tell you uh, two things real quick. Again, life groups in the lobby, but uh, we are really excited, my wife and I, to, to host the first annual our first ever uh, life uh, uh, marriage conference one night uh, at Radiate Church. It's in Camden. It's going to be, I just really feel like we need to lean into this thing and really build some relationships. And uh, so registration uh, opens next Sunday uh, right here at, at Radiate Church. It opens next Sunday. We will have an early bird rate uh, for you on that. Don't worry, we've made it affordable, but there's dinner included. It's going to be, it is limited. So come in, come ready next Sunday to get signed up and be a part of that. It's going to be an amazing Amazing. I'm telling you, it's going to be one of the best things we've probably ever done. And I'm excited to see what God's going to do there as we have a real open and honest conversation. So kid, don't bring your kids. This is not child care provided. Uh, we are having a real open and honest conversation about marriage. And, uh, and hey, if you're engaged, you're welcome to come to that as well uh, because you're going to need it. All right. You're going to need those conversations. Uh, and, and it's going to be a great time. So we're excited to have that and we're excited to get moving uh, in, in that and in life groups today. Um, man, I'm just pumped. I'm just pumped. I feel like there's a spirit of excitement and expectancy in the room today. Ephesians 3.20 tells me that God doesn't just meet my expectations, he exceeds my expectations. And so I just feel a palpable energy in the room today. So I want you to title your message this. If you go in your Radiate Church app and you click on Sermon Notes, the Sermon Notes are actually right there in the Radiate Church app for you. So you can pull that up if you haven't downloaded it yet. Shame on you. But, uh, no, I'm just kidding. It's okay. Uh, just go ahead and download that and you can find it. But you can title it this, Find Your Edge. Find Your Edge. Find your edge. Find your edge. Uh, we're going to hang out in 2 Kings chapter 6 a lot today, but, but here's the truth. I want to tell you a story about two men, and we're going to call them Austin, and we're going to call them Travis. That's our two men that we're going to talk about today uh, at, at Radiate Church. And, and these two men, they were from back in the day. They were loggers, right? They enjoyed logging. They, they cut down trees and, and all this stuff, right, and with axes. And so they, these two guys were pretty prideful. One of them uh, tried to act like he was uh, the mini Hulk walking around all all the time, you know, and, and he had weird mustaches that he grew into beards and things like that. The other guy, he, he was great. He was just really decisive at what he did. And, and he talked about military terms all the time and all this kind of stuff, right? And, and so Travis is, is, is there and Austin's there and they get in this thing and at dinner one night and they're talking and they're like, I bet I can cut down more trees than you. Typical, typical guy talk, right? And so they have this conversation and they say, all right, let's find out in the morning. So both of them go out, they get up early in the morning, they go out there, they got their axes, right? And so Austin just starts swinging away, man. And Austin doesn't hear Travis swinging away and hitting the tree yet. So he's going and Austin's swinging away. And in Austin's mind, Austin's like, oh yeah, I got this. I got an early start. I, I started cutting down the tree before Travis did. And so all this is happening and then they start going. And a, few, a little while later, about an hour or two later, Austin notices he doesn't hear Travis swinging his axe again. Whenever Austin sits down to take a breather, he notices, I, I don't hear anything. About every, about every 45 minutes, he hears Travis stop swinging, stop hitting the tree. And so Austin, in his mind, you know, all day long, he's like, oh, I got this. He's taking breaks, 15-minute breaks every time. It's ridiculous. What is this guy doing? I am going to crush him, right? And so he goes, and, and at the end of the day, they come together, and they count their trees, and Come to find out, man, some way, somehow, Travis cut down more trees than Austin did. Austin, Austin was embarrassed. Austin got beat. He couldn't figure out what happened. And so Austin looked at Travis. He said, Travis, what, what did you do that was so different? How did you cut down? Did you have a steel chainsaw over there or something? Like, what did you do, man? And Austin, Austin said, you, you took a break for 15 minutes every 45 minutes. So, like, that you didn't even cut the whole hour. And I was over there swinging away doing everything. And Travis looked at him and smiled with this grin, and he looked at him and he said, Austin, while you were swinging away, I'd take time and sharpen my axe. Every, 50, every 45 minutes, I'd sit down and I'd sharpen my axe for 15 minutes. And he said, you do know that, that trees go down faster when the axe is sharper, right? And, and, and I want you to hear me when I say this. Like, I, Here's what I think the expectancy is in the room today, and you don't even know it, but I believe that some of us are in a place to where we got to sit down and start sharpening our axe because we're, we're hitting a tree with a dull edge and then we're wondering why the trees aren't falling. 
Why, why am I not seeing success? Why am I not seeing the accomplishment? Why, why are these things not taking place like I know that they can? Like the, the prayer that, 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 that I prayed, like the sacrifices that I've made, like the obedience that pastor has told me to do or the Bible told me to do or whatever. Like why in the world? And for some of us, it's, it's not that you're not trying hard. It's not even that you're not swinging. It's not even that you wake up in the day and, and you're not doing anything. It's that your axe is so dull that it couldn't cut a vine, much less a tree. And, and, and we get to the end of the day. Have you ever done this? You get to the end of the day and you feel so worn out from swinging so hard throughout the day. But at the end of the day, you lay down and you're like, man, I lost today. I lost it. It's okay to admit that, by the way. It's all, it's all right. Because we all get to a place sometimes where it feels like we lay our head down at night and we are exhausted. We've exerted all of, our, all of our energy. We've exerted all of our thoughts. We've done everything that we think we can do in the moment, but we lay our head down at night and we have lost the game. And let me just say this. I, I, I told Pastor Travis this this week and it, it came to me as I was thinking about some leadership stuff. Is this quit? Please know this about whenever you feel like you're losing. Quitters walk away. Winners swing away until the game's over. Quitters walk away. Quitters just go, I don't feel like it. I feel like I'm losing. It's not working. It's not. Quitters walk away. But when I'm committed to something and I know I can win at it, I keep swinging until I have won, until the game is over and I've won. Because here's what we got to learn to do, man. If we're going to start fast and we're going to finish the year strong, we got to start sharpening our axe. That's why I love, 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 love life groups at Ready Eight Church. I'm doing a life group. My wife and I are doing one this year, uh, this semester on parenting. And it's going to be an amazing thing to do. But I, I, I know there's so many great ones that are taking place. And here's why I love life groups. Because the Bible tells me that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Listen, some of us, the problem isn't our intentions. The problem isn't even our work ethic. The problem isn't our desire. The problem isn't our, 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 our pushing. Our, the problem is we're swinging a dull axe with no edge to it anymore. And somewhere along the way... We've lost our edge. But today, I want to tell you, you're going to find your edge today. Anybody in the room believe me? Come on. Yeah. Come on, somebody. we got to wake up a little bit today. We're going, to, we're going to find our edge today. We're going to see what takes place. We're going to watch God change, change lives today. In 2 Kings chapter 6, as we've been talking about the story of Elisha and the, the ministry and the life of Elisha, verses 1 through 3, we're actually going to read verses 1 through 7. But I, I want to go 1 through 3 to begin with. And it says this. It says, now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold now, the place where we are living is, please, please, please pay attention to these words. The place where we are living is too limited for us. In other words, hey, is this place is too small. It doesn't hold us anymore, and there's definitely not room for anybody else. Literally what, what this is, the sons of the prophets, and let me just tell you, that it's a ministry school. It's a school of ministry with Elisha. One day, Ready 8 Church is going to have a school of ministry. Uh, and we're going to have people that are going to go, hey, it's too small. we got to increase. we got to expand what's happening. And so verse 1, it tells them the problem. And then verse 2, it says, here's the solution. Please let us go to the Jordan and each of us take from there a beam. And, and, and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. So he said, go. Elisha said, Go. And then one of, the, one of them said, please be willing to go with your servants. And he said, I shall, I shall, I shall go. They, they were excited. I, I love the fact that they were smart enough to realize that the place that they were currently living was entirely too small for where they could continue living. Most of us, hear me today, a lot of us, not most of us, but a lot of us will continue living in a place that's too small and never do anything about it. A mentality that's too small, and a, a, a prayer life that's too small, and a faith life that's too small, a spiritual maturity that's too small. And then we want to know why we never see great things from God, and it's because we believe a God that's too small. They, they said, hey, it's too small for me. We can't live here. We're not doing what we need to do. We're not going where we need to go. We're definitely not ready for growth. And, and we need to go. And they didn't just say, hey, Elisha, you're the leader. You're the teacher. You're the pastor. You're the prophet of this school of ministry, Elisha's school of ministry here. You are in charge. of. You need to make this place bigger. They said, no, let us. 
Let us go and fell beams. Let us go and cut down logs. Can I just be honest with you today? I, I need some people and leaders need some people that recognize when things are too small and go out and don't just go to the leader and say it's up to you to figure it out. But they go, hey, here's my solution. Can I make this happen? Sometimes we just need permission to go out and start cutting down beams and making things bigger. I, I don't know about you, but we need some people at Radiate Church that are willing to go out and say we need more people and we need more ministries and we need more systems and we need more this and we need more that because the growth isn't done yet. Anybody in the room today, you know what I'm saying? Like growth, growth is a mentality. Growth is a mentality. We can't just look and go, oh, it's too small. Oh, well, I'll just live here. Grow, and, and, and when we truly, hear me, when God is truly at the center of our lives, we will always come to places where things are too small because God never wants us to live in small places. He always wants us to expand and grow. And when he always wants us to expand and grow, then eventually we expand past the place of our current capacity. And so we have to be willing to go through the pain and the stretching and the frustration to stretch and grow to a bigger place. That's why most of us go through emotional uh, uh, frustration. We go through mental frustration. We go through spiritual frustration. It's not the tension and the frustration isn't the problem. A lot of times we run from the tension and the frustration because it's not fun and it's not comfortable. Hear me today. The tension and the frustration isn't the problem. The tension and the frustration is sim simply an indication that stretching and growth is taking place. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs to grab that today. The tension and frustration is not our problem. It's our response to it. Do we run from the tension and frustration? Because hear me, if we always run from tension, frustration, and stress, we'll always stay where we're at. But if we lean into it and we go, all right, God, what are you trying to teach me? All right, expand my mentality. All right, expand my capacity for loving my neighbor and my enemy. Expand my prayer life. Expand my expectancy. Expand my marriage. Expand it. Whenever we lean into it, then all of a sudden the tension and frustration becomes an opportunity to where we get better and not bitter. And so we don't get mad about what's happening. We lean into it and we welcome. We welcome the moments of those things. And and I just want to tell you today, like at the very beginning, don't settle for small places in your life. Stop settling for small places. Stop settling. Stop settling for small mentalities. Like, oh, I, I've just always learned that I'll never, I've never had this and I'll never that and, and this can never happen to me and I, ne I this and I that and these things and this person against me. Like, don't settle for small mentalities just because that's what you've always had. Get out and learn how to think bigger. Get around people that think bigger and believe bigger and pray bigger and live bigger than you and find out what they're doing. Find out what they're saying. Find out what they're believing. Find out what they're studying. Find out what they're reading. I hear people all the time, I hate to read. Then you'll always stay within your own context of information. Get out and read the information that other people have that you don't quite have yet. Go find the, the revelation that God's giving them that he's trying to get through to you, but you won't pick up a book and read or an article or a podcast or whatever it is. Like, Don't come in here with this mentality, a small mentality of, all right, we just sing three songs, we sit down, we listen to a preacher, we go home, we do things. No, come in here with a mentality that if I give an invite, it changes somebody's life. That, that I'm not just coming to meet at a school for church. I'm coming, and this is a building process for something God is doing that's gonna change lives all over the place. This is not just a few hundred people coming together, but this is the beginning of thousands of people coming together one day. I'm not just here to serve, but I'm raising up as a leader come in here with a bigger mentality in in our lives like expand and grow don't stay in small places go to the Jordan and cut down cut down the beams I I'm a starter all right let me just tell you a little bit about me I'm a starter right I get excited about things starting. I get excited about the process of starting. I get excited about the back end where you got to do all the organizational stuff, right? I, gotta, I get excited about organizing this and organizing that. I, I get excited about people getting excited about starting. Most people get excited about starting. Most people get excited when things begin because it's the excitement of what's to come that fuels what's happening, right? And so think about it like this, right? Remember if you're married in the room, right? Or if you're dating in the room. Remember how excited you were when you first got married. Remember how excited you were when you first started dating. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, you're on, <laughs> praise God right there. That's my man right there. He, you know what I'm talking about? Like, 
you're on the phone and in your mind, you're like, I cannot believe she's talking to me. And then, it, and then it's the cheesy stuff that's like, you hang up first. Y'all know what I'm talking about. No, 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 no. You hang up first. And it's like, okay, on the count of three, one, two, three. A 10 second silence. Like, you still there? Yeah, I just couldn't do it, baby. I just couldn't do it, right? You got a picture of, of her or him on your dashboard right there by your, you can't even tell that you're speeding. So when Live PD pulls you over, you're like, she was staring at me. I just, she's so beautiful. Don't even know. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? The excitement of building a life together and buying a house together and getting in debt. To get, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> buying a house, building a life and having kids and honeymoons. Y'all got awkward all of a sudden. Y'all like, can I cheer for that? Yes, you're married. All right, it's okay. All this stuff, right? And then think about, think about whenever you first like gave your life to Jesus. The excitement that's there, right? The, 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 like you come and, and you make that prayer and you, you hold that clipboard and you fill that out and, and, you, and you get a phone call that week for help and prayer and you go home with your first Bible from Radiate Church and you join that life group. Like it's excitement. It's like, yeah, and you can't wait to tell people. And you're like, you got to come to church with me this week. I gave my life to the Lord and it's changed everything about my life, right? Or, or maybe it's church commitment, like you're saved and, and you've given your life to the Lord and all of a sudden you've joined a team and it's like, yeah, I get to get up at 5.30 on a Sunday morning and set up pipe and drape, baby, right? Or I get to go change diapers in the nursery this week, you know? Or I'm gonna, I'm committed to helping teenagers that's the most smart aleck people I've ever met in my life. Well, I'm excited, you know, let's have fun with it, right? Man, I don't know about you. I love starting things. And that's the beauty of it all. It's like I love the excitement. And their excitement to begin to expand talked Elisha into even moving and going with them. Like, hey, pick up the whole school of ministry and let's go down here and build a bigger place. Because this place ain't big enough for your anointing. This place ain't big enough for what God's going to do. So let's go down here and let's build something. Like, hey, Elisha, I, listen, I'll give, I'll sacrifice I'll, I'll fell a beam, I'll, I'll cut down trees, I'll build the place. If you just come, man, just come. You ever been around somebody that's so excited about something that they talk you into it and you don't even know what you just agreed to? Like they're sitting there like, oh yeah, let's go, woo! And you're like, okay, let's go, where are we going? What's happening, right? And you get there and you're like, oh no, okay. <laughs> Praise God. That's kind of what was happening. Like their, their, their excitement was so infectious. That Elisha was joining them in the whole movement. And if we continue reading the story in verses 4 and 5, it, it, it says this. So they go and he, he, he agrees to go with them. And then it says, so he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. So they didn't just talk about growth. They were about growth. They started fast. They picked up and they moved. And then they started doing what they had to do. Can I just tell you, I think the Lord's looking for some people that's willing to do whatever they need to do in order to get where he wants them to go. Not, not just spiritually, but physically too. Like, don't just sit back and go, I want our church to grow. Like, get up, pick up the invite cards and go invite people. Like, go pray over homes. Go pray over names. Like, pray over pictures. Pray over Facebook. Please, God, anoint Facebook. You know what I'm saying? Like, all this stuff, like... Where do we want to go? And we're willing to do it, right? And so he talks about that and go and they cut it down. Then verse five takes place. And it says, but as one was felling a being, the ax head fell into the water and he cried out and said, alas, master, for it was, it was borrowed. <laughs> you ever lost something? Somebody let you borrow? You're like, God, please don't let me see them until I find this. I don't want to explain what happened. If you actually look at the, the original translation and the original text, it was borrowed. It, it's translated correctly, but the way that it's actually translated to begin with is it was translated to, it, it actually means it was asked for or it was begged for. So, so this guy goes, hey, Elisha, like we're growing, but I started off my Sunday with a mistake, man. I just lost something that somebody let me borrow and it ain't even mine. And, and, and Elisha, he, he looks at him and, and in other words, he looks at him and goes, Elisha, I begged somebody for this axe head so that I could prepare for growth. Elisha, I begged somebody for this so that we could come and, and we could do this growth, and I just lost it. It, it. Let me give you this. If we're not careful, we can lose what we beg for, and what we beg for can, can defeat us. Let, let, me, let me put it like this. Let me put it like this. 
How many times did we beg for the job that we have, but now we hate it? And all we do is complain about it. How, how many times when we first met our wife, did we beg God to give her our hand in marriage? Give us her hand in marriage. And now what used to be cute is annoying. It's called life. But we get through it. Hear me. If we're not careful, we'll lose what we begged for. If we're not careful, the very miracle that we're begging God for right now, we'll lose. If we're not careful, it's, hey, God, I want to be really close to you. And God's going, I want you to be really close to me. But over time, we can lose the edge that makes a difference. And so I can just see some of us were, have you ever felt like you're just swinging away? And, 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 and all, you know, you're just all of a sudden for the first time you're starting fast and it's, the trees are falling and you're building the, the building and the beams are coming down and you're doing what you got to do and it's happening. And then over time it's like this isn't working anymore, but you keep swinging the same pace. You keep swinging the same swing. You keep doing the same thing without us even realizing that the edge fell off the handle. We're just hitting a handle, a dull handle against the tree now. And we're so caught up in the routine, we're so caught up in the action, we're so caught up in the swing, we're still caught up in the, in the work of it all, we're still caught up in the religion of it all that we don't even realize that the axe head fell off the handle. And what we begged for is now gone. God, I, 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 need, I need your grace, and then we lose it. God, I need your forgiveness, and we beg for it, and he gives it. And now we lose it. God, I, I need a miracle. I need a kid. God, I'm begging you for a kid. And then we lose our edge. And now we're complaining about everything that they do. Come on, somebody. God, I, I need you to meet my needs through a paycheck. Give me this job. And whenever we got the job, we're still swinging away. But then six months later, so I hate this job. I hate my boss. And I can't believe this. And I can't believe I'm one foot in and one foot out. It may be bad. But it's still a blessing. Because he met your needs through your begging. And if we're not careful, we'll lose what we begged for. It doesn't stay with us all the time. And we got to ask ourselves, are we going through the motions without the edge? And please hear this. This is going to come on the screen today. It's this. Success is not determined by what we start. Success is determined by what we sustain. Success, I don't care if we start something every single day of the week. It's Success is determined by what we sustain. It's great that you started the one-year Bible on January 1. But success in completing that and knowing God at a deeper level comes whenever you are December 31st, 2020, and you've sustained the edge to know God. It's great that you want to start a life group, but please hear me halfway through the semester. Don't, get, don't let life get in the way and you lose your edge for what God's giving you in community. It's great that you get excited and in a moment you serve, but please, when it gets hard and we're actually building and we have to continue doing what we do as we build for something in the future, don't go, oh, I've lost my, my edge. That's, here's how a lot of us say it. I'm burned out. I, I'm burned out, man. I'm just, I'm just burned. You know when fire loses its flame? When there's no more fuel. There's no more fuel. Guess whose job it is to provide the fuel? Ours. Are we reading? Are we praying? Are we studying? Are we in community with believers? Are we having fun? Are we worshiping? Are we even attending church? Or are we doing these things? Because the truth is, is we got to understand that success is not determined by what you start. It's what you sustain it. And go back to the marriage thing. We were excited when we started, but now what was exciting has become annoying. Man, salvation, what we couldn't wait to tell others, we now take for granted. Salvation is not an opportunity for eternal life with God anymore. It's an opportunity for us to do whatever we want because Jesus, after all, died on the cross. Uh, the excitement that we had whenever we started serving our church and getting involved in our church, we couldn't wait to show up on Sundays. We couldn't wait to get here and be a part of it, but now everything else determines our level of commitment. My kids' sports schedules, my attitude towards people in the church, my you know, how I slept the night before. Whereas before, it didn't matter. I'd stay up on Xbox till 2 a.m. and then get up and go to church. But now, if I'm up past 10 p.m., I just, I can't do it anymore. And it's raining. 
God forbid it ever rains. I pray that God puts a mandate in the kingdom that says it never rains on a Sunday ever again in the history of the universe. Because after all, rain determines our level of commitment to the church. Are you with me? Like the excitement of it starting. And then we lose our edge. Here's, here's four things I want to give you real quick, uh, real quick today. How to, how to know, four things of how to know you've lost your edge. It's this. Number one, I'm going to go through them quickly. Number one, working harder, but you're seeing fewer results. You've lost your, you've lost your edge if you're still working as hard as you've ever worked or harder than you've ever worked. You ever feel like you're just swinging away and maybe you're even swinging harder than you ever did, but you're seeing fewer results in some way, shape, or form. You've lost Lost your edge, man. Maybe you've been out of the word. Maybe you've been out of community with believers. Maybe whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But if you're working harder but seeing fewer results, you've, you've lost your edge. You've lost your edge. Maybe, maybe where you once, here's another one, where you once found joy, you now see obligation. Where you once found joy, or here's another way to say it. I heard one of my pastors say it this way one time was, what, you, what once was worship is now work. I used to worship God by praying over the chairs as I set them up. I used to worship God by working in the parking lot. I used to worship God by doing these things, but now it's just a job. It's just a job. God forbid the church have expectations. I used to worship through the expectations, but now it's just, it's just a work. It's just a job. Or not just the church, but anything. What once was worship. You know, the Bible says that everything we do, do as unto the Lord. In other words, everything you do, do it as worship. It's an act of worship. Romans 12 tells us that our bodies are living sacrifice. Worship to the Lord. What once was worship is now work. Here's another one. When lack of life no longer alarms you, you've probably lost your edge. Going through the motions. And what, what used to inspire you, people getting saved at church and people giving their lives to the Lord, people getting baptized, people getting in life groups. You know, whatever it is, people joining teams, all this stuff. It used to inspire me. Hearing sermons used to fire me up. But now there's no life there. There's no inspiration. There's no energy. There's no attitude. Can I just tell you this? That if what used to bring you joy now doesn't, if the lack of life and energy and inspiration in your life is no longer there and it doesn't alarm you anymore, You've probably lost your edge. Here's another one. You've probably lost your edge if you show up, but you're not present. You're there in body, but you're not there in heart, mind, and soul. Hey, God, I, I'm here again today. I'm alive. I show up to work. I show up to read my Bible. But I'm not present. I'm not learning. I'm not growing. I'm not communicating. I'm not building relationships. I'm just here. I don't have a joy. I don't have a smile. I'm not excited about what you're doing. It's just, I show up, but I'm not present, right? And some of those, and, and there's so many more, some of you are like, oh, that's me. I've probably lost my edge. How did I do that? Well, here's some ways that you can lose your edge. Losing your edge, please hear me. Losing your edge is a slow fade. It's a day by day. You don't wake up in the morning and just no edge be there. It's a slow fade that you make a compromise in this area that turns into a compromise in that area that turns into a compromise in that area. And over time, the edge is gone. It's, oh, I'll, I'll miss it today. God will understand. And then next month, it's, oh, I'll miss it today and tomorrow. And it's not a big deal. And before we know it, we've lost our spiritual connection with God. We've lost our, we've lost our edge because of a slow fade. How, did I, how can you... Lose your edge. What are some ways you can lose your edge? The first one is this. You lose your why. You can lose your why. When you lose your why, you lose your way. Don't ever forget why you're doing this. Hear me today. You're not doing this for anybody else's approval. You know what frustrates me the most is when people make spiritual decisions based on somebody else's opinions. Why do we do that? Because we've forgotten the why. Because somebody else's experience is now determining my own. 
When we lose our why, we lose our way. I, I want you to know something. The people that serve, the over 150 people that serve here at Radiate Church, and, and I'm praying and believing there's going to be over 250 people by the end of this year that serve at Radiate Church. But the people that do that, they don't do it because they enjoy getting up at 530 on a Sunday morning, and they come in here and they lug heavy stuff, and they make things happen. They may enjoy it, but they do it because there's a why behind it, because we are going to see lives changed forever by this. Why, 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 why? You don't, you don't come to church to please me. You come to church to worship God. You come to church to connect with other believers. When we lose our why, that's, we can lose our edge. We lose our edge. We can lose our edge by focusing on the wrong things. You know how I know God is about to do something big in my life? Because the enemy brings more distractions. To try to get me to look to the left, to the right front of or behind me but as long as I don't look to him then everything's going to be okay we can focus on the wrong things that's the problem with victim mentality and negative mentalities is we're focusing not on God's blessing but on everything around us the, another way we can lose our edge is um, is we can lose the blessings of God what do you mean remember he begged for the axe head but he lost it if we're not careful we, when we lose the blessings of God, we'll become dull. And it's not because God doesn't want to bless us. It's because we've lost it and we didn't ever go find it. it. We can lose the blessing. We can lose by focusing on the wrong things, to lose the why. The fourth one, the last one is uh, we can lose our edge by losing the urgency in our lives. The urgency. Remember when you were dating I remember whenever you first got saved or remember the passion you had whenever you were really good at that sport or doing that thing. Remember the urgency. You had to wake up in the morning and practice. You had to wake up in the morning and text them immediately or call them or FaceTime them immediately. You had to, there was an urgency that you couldn't wait any longer. What happened to the spiritual urgency? If there's no spiritual urgency in your life that we don't, we aren't guaranteed tomorrow. Life is but a vapor and we don't have tomorrow to go. Maybe tomorrow I can help grow the church. Maybe tomorrow I can help bring them uh, to life in Jesus. Maybe tomorrow I can tell them what God can do in their life. No, what if we don't have tomorrow? There's a, I know in my life I live with a constant state of spiritual urgency because I'm always reminded through a medical condition that tomorrow is never guaranteed. But that is okay because I've got to have some urgency that if tomorrow never comes, I will do everything I've got to do today to reach as many people as possible. I will do what only I can do so that he can do what only he can do. Where is the urgency? When we lose our urgency, we are gonna lose our edge. But 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, thank you for sticking with me for a moment. It says this, then the man of God, Elisha said, where did it fall? Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and he made the iron float. And he said, take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and took it. I don't know if you know this or not, but iron can't float. Scientific. Hear me today. Where did you lose it? Where did you lose the edge? Where did you lose your urgency, your fire, your passion? We're going to do this thing. God's going to do big things for me, through me. And I, I can't get into this. Ah, I can't get into this. But I need you to understand this basic truth. We'll get into it another time. But it's this. Everything God wants to do in the earth, he wants to do through you. When God wants to get something into the earth, he has to put it through someone to get it here. And so when we lose our edge, we're blocking God's plan. Where, where did we lose it? And I know you're like, I lost my edge. I'll never get it back. Hear me. He looked at the man. He said, where'd you lose it? And all of a sudden, a miracle happened and God made that iron float again. You will never be able to make the iron float. You will never be able to make the axe head float. Your edge will never come back to the top of the river by your own actions, by your own doing, by your own work. But it is only God that can make iron float. It is only God that can bring it back. I need to ask you a very serious question. Where... Did you lose it? Did you lose it at a previous church that hurt you? Did you lose it at this church that hurt you? Did you lose it with someone? Did you lose it in a previous marriage, in a relationship, in a father figure that turned you down? Where 
Did you lose your edge? Where's it at? Because if we can identify where we lost the edge, God can make the iron float. And here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. Here's, here's what I know. Here's what's about to happen. Some of you in your minds are already going, I know where I lost it. Or you're going, I don't know exactly where I lost it, but it's somewhere in this vicinity of life. I got sick or this took place. This is a very personal message for me. Because I know some of you think pastors are always on fire, but pastors lose their edge sometimes too. And I know that there's times in my life I have to go back and say, God, I don't know, but it was somewhere between there and there. And God will go, that's fine. But here's the thing, hear me. God will make the iron float, but you got to reach down and grab it. Elisha didn't grab the iron head. He didn't pick up the axe head and say, here you go. Elisha said, there it is. Now you go pick it up. God will make it float. You got to wait in the water. Go get your edge back. Will you bow your heads with me today? Find your edge. Find your edge in a life group. Find your edge in in prayer find your edge in God's call for your life find your edge at this church find your edge in your marriage in your parenting in your relationships in your leadership find find that edge man how many of you in the room today and I'm gonna ask two prayer prayer requests number one that you'd say pastor I need to give my life to to the Lord today today's the day where I start a new life with him and I need to submit my life to him and ask for his forgiveness to start over all over again. If that's you in the room today, would you throw your hand in the air and say, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus today. Amen. Amen. Now let me ask you this. How many in the room today would say, man, my edge is is dull. It's dull and, and, and there's a myriad of reasons. One I listed or one I didn't. My edge is dull. I need to find my edge. I need God to make the iron float again. I'll I'll go get it. I just need to see it. I just need God to make the iron float again. If that's you and you're in the room and you say, God, Pastor, I just need God to to show me my edge again, to find, help me find my edge again. I'll get in the Word. I'll get in the life group. I'll serve. I'll, I'll pray. I'll worship. I just, I just need my edge back. If that's you and you're in the room today, would you throw your hand in the air so that we can pray together all over the room today? Hold them up. Just hold them up. Throughout this prayer, I, just, I challenge you to keep your hand raised and I just believe as we keep our hand raised through this prayer that God's just going to take it as a symbolic nature that I'm surrendering my life and God bring me my edge. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I just, I speak blessing. God, I pray that you would make the iron float today. God, I pray Holy Spirit power in their lives, empowerment, God, and enlightenment, revelation like never before, God, that we would find our edge, that we wouldn't have to be motivated by outside sources to go to you, but God, we would be motivated by a love and a desire for you. God, bring us our edge back. God, make the iron float, God, wherever they lost it, help them, God, wade in the waters of the details and the muck and the mud of wherever they lost it to deal with the frustration and the pain and the hurt all over again, to get through that and get past that to grab their edge. God, it's not over. You have a purpose. You have a purpose for us. You have a plan for us. And I begin to declare today that as our edge floats right back up to the surface, that purpose comes back. You're uncovering dry dreams. You're uncovering and bringing back to life dry bones today. And God, you're beginning to bring things up to the surface of our lives, God. God, bring us our edge, God, so that we can have the urgency to expand your kingdom in this room today. God, we're so grateful for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. And God, we honor you and we worship you in the room today. In your holy name we pray, amen and amen. Would you put your hands together for what God's doing in the room today? I believe we found our edge. I believe God is making the iron float again. On your way out, there's people waiting on you to sign you up in a life group today. Grab your invite cards. Bring somebody with you next week as we conclude this series. I love you guys. I'll see you next Sunday. Let's go change the world.